Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the Mission Impossible podcast, almost purely dedicated to annoying former Oscar winners. Yeah, that's what we do. Right? That's our goal. It's our goal. It's. <laughs> I mean, we've done it a lot so far. Yes. We have quite a few Oscar winners that we've we've done a good job annoying, I yes. think. Yes. Yeah. And we're doing it again today. We just want to keep them as long as we can to talk to us, and then they're like, get the hell out of here, yeah. kid. <laughs> exactly. And today, another Oscar winner. Yes. We, Paul Hirsch. We went back. He met us at the door and said, I can't believe you came back. <laughs> so, yeah, we're talking to him and he is amazing. He's got a brand new book out. Yes. Oh, I'm Charles, by the way. Oh, yeah. Drew is always. Uh, yeah, the book you should get. It's really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a great read. He's a really it's really great descriptions. Great memory. So many funny stories. Highly recommend you get it. It's on Amazon. You got the hard copy. I did. Which he was nice enough to sign did for you. Did you see what he said? No. He said, I can't believe you came a second time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he wrote as his yeah. message to you? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and I have the digital one on my phone that I was reading in the middle of a move and taking care of a child. So yeah. So I did not get him to sign mine, unfortunately. So no, I went home hard. and cried. Yeah. But uh, we were so, it was a thrill to talk to him again. He's got such a crazy, insane career. Yeah. Um, and he's such a smart, funny guy. He was very grateful, you can tell, for the career he's had. Yeah. And in the first episode, we... This is another three-parter, by the way. Yes. Um, in the first episode, a lot about Mission Impossible, right? Yes. And and and, and we get the, the most important answer ever. We asked about the rat. Yes. Everybody always asks about the rat in the, uh, in the vents in the first Mission Impossible movie. Yeah. Well, we talk about it. Yeah. He gives us an answer. He, he knew the, it's like he knew the question was coming too. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if people would come up to him and ask him about that. Todd was talking about this on Twitter recently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it sounded like they do, <laughs> but he doesn't bring it up in the book. No. So we had to, we had to confront him. And we we got it. We got our answer and you, you guys now have your answer. Yeah. Um, what else in this episode should people be listening for? Um, he, we, he talks about World War Z. It's pretty fascinating what happened with that movie. Yeah. He was there. He had a front row seat. To everything that happened with World War Z and how Damon Lindelof, if you don't know, came in and fixed the yes. third act. Yeah. Well, he gives us details of what the original third act was. It's yeah. crazy. It I had crazy. no I, I had never heard that stuff before. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Anything um, else? I think that's it. Okay, we we enjoy, primed the pump. Yeah, enjoy uh enjoy the interview. Yeah, we'll be back afterwards to wrap things up. Okay. We're back. Excellent. With the amazing, legendary. No, I'm real. You're real, but you are legendary, <laughs> Paul Hirsch. No, I'm yes. real. Um, your real, new book is called. Person. You are a real person. Your new book is called A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away. It's amazing. Thank you. I just ate it up. Charles ate it on his, his phone and his uh, I iPad. I'm in the middle of a move and I have a baby, move. so it's a little hard. Harder for him. Right now. But. but. In you, between all of that, I've been no judgments devouring the book. Not making yeah. any judgments. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah, we're, I mean, where do we begin? Do we start off with Mission Impossible? Uh, I, yeah. I mean, there's so much to talk about. And you told us stories last time about Mission Impossible, but uh, you okay. know, I didn't realize that you were brought on later. That there was already someone cutting the movie, right? Well, that's not exactly true. Okay. What? What? I mean, I was the second editor hired, but production had not yet begun. Oh, okay. And the reason I was hired was that the picture was supposed to come out at Christmas. And uh, Brian was concerned that Jerry wouldn't be able to... Jerry Greenberg was the uh, first editor hired. Uh, Jerry was the first New York editor ever to win an Oscar for The French Connection. Fabulous editor. And when I was unavailable to Brian for the first time, because I was going off to do Empire Strikes Back, he said... Who's going to cut my movie? He was prepping Dress to Kill. I said, well, the best editor in New York is Jerry Greenberg. So he hired Jerry. And then Jerry just kept cutting all his movies. And I thought, <laughs> I'll never get my job back, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Jerry's a great editor. And uh, loved working for Brian because Brian's movies are so visual and so much fun to, to put together, you know. So... Um, he had hired Jerry, and he was concerned that Jerry wasn't going to be able to make the, the deadline, so he thought, well, well, 
we're high, you know, we'll hire Paul as the second editor. And Paramount was concerned about uh, overtime. So they made a deal with me. They did a seven-day buyout where they paid me, they guaranteed me a weekly salary that was uh, less than I would make if I got my rate plus overtime on the weekends. But the seven-day buyout was more than my then rate. As it turned out, Tom Cruise never wanted the picture to come out at Christmas. It got pushed to the following May, and I wound up not working a single weekend day in the whole, I think it was 16 months I was on the picture. Whoa. So. You did well. I did the seven-day buyout. I mean, <laughs> the biggest mistake they ever made. But this interesting thing about studios is once they have a uh, number down in the budget, they never question it again. It's, it's there and it's just, it's in, the, it's in the machine and the machine writes the checks and they never question it. They never come back and say, listen, uh, you haven't worked any weekends, you know, so <laughs> how about giving some of that money back? They never did. Why did he want it for the summer? He just wanted it to be a big summer movie. I mean, is that how he kind of saw it? I don't know. I okay. mean, you know, Tom was the producer and, um, you know Tom. I, we 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 hopefully will know Tom <laughs> soon. But but you know he's got a lot of ideas. Very smart and very uh, you know he he's got a a, a a will of iron. But Brian kept yeah. him out of the editing room. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. that's true. That's amazing. It surprised me, but uh, but you know Brian has a will of iron too. Right? Yeah. I mean, when you were putting together the your when you signed on, your your big thing was the Langley heist sequence. I think is a like amazing, the most amazing thing ever. Well, there were three big set pieces in the in the picture. But you weren't doing Prague initially, right? You moved to Prague after Jerry left. After Jerry was asked to leave. After Jerry was asked to leave. Well, there were several other scenes shot in Prague apart from the big set piece, which was the assassination of the unit. Yes. So I worked on those, like the the uh, the fish tank restaurant, you know, the aquarium, whatever it's called, and um, and Jerry was was working on the the embassy. Yeah. So uh, we were working simultaneously, and then Jerry left, was asked to leave, whatever, and I took over at that point. You said that they had. You, I think you mentioned this to us last time in the interview too. That he, Jerry Greenberg and De Palma, had had some issues, maybe. And you also talked about how Jerry Greenberg was taking very long weekends with a new girlfriend. Yeah, he was flying to New well, York. Was that the reason why they had? I don't know. Out? I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's in the book, so maybe. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> th- did I say I knew? I in think the book? you. I think you talked about his because he would leave on Thursday night and not come back no, on he, Tuesday. No, Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon and come back. And then on come Tuesday. back. Come back come Monday, Monday, Monday morning. Monday, 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 yeah. Monday late. Yeah. Um, well, maybe you can clear this up because we've heard some varying reports. You saw the raw footage of the of the aquarium sequence. So, yeah. yeah, was that Tom the entire time? It was Tom the entire time, except when he there's a side angle of him coming through. Uh, it's a sort of a wide shot of him coming through. It was a dangerous stunt, and they put in a stunt guy and they replaced his face with Tom's. Was that our guy? Yes, we actually talked to him. Oh. <laughs> yeah, nice guy. He worked on a movie that I just did, so we, we I just like happened to have a conversation uh, at, a, at like at the end of the week, and he just mentioned, "Oh yeah, and I did a Mission Impossible, Mission Impossible Two. I was Tom Cruise's stunt double." We're like, "Oh my god, one." He was in the first one, yeah. So no. he, so we interviewed him and talked about T O O, not T W O. He did the first one and the second, and the second movie. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. But he described to us that there was one shot in the movie where they did face replacement. Yeah, uh, it was. It was like. It's not that Tom early would do days. it. It was early days. It was early days of face replacement, he said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, should we ask the big rat question? We should ask that. Yeah, we, we neglected to ask about the rat last time. This yeah. is an important thing that people wonder about. Yeah, it was never <laughs> so, shot. Well, the, it was never intended to be shot. What was it? Him, him, him killing the rat. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, so you just... knew this was coming. Did, did I email you this question already? No, <laughs> How no, did you I, know we were going to ask this? No, but I, <laughs> I've seen other people, you know. Oh, okay, yes. Um, so it was never shot. No. Always assumed he killed the rat off camera. Yeah. Okay. Was there any discussion about why the rat was up there? Or was it just a De Palma-y kind of gasser? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense why 
they 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 put so much effort into getting in this into this ceiling, and then there's a rat there. Like you'd think that nothing could get in there. But did did he talk to you about that at all, or was it just one more sort of complication? You know, it's funny what people accept and question in movies. You know, yeah. There, first of all, why did the CIA put man-sized air ducts, you know, in in their <laughs> in their in their building? You don't question that. Yeah. yeah. That goes right into the you know the secure vault. Yes. And then, I think later after they escape, they're they're uh, talking about you know they couldn't figure out how they got out. You know, well, why? You know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, no, we never. Nobody ever talked about killing the rat on screen. You know? Did you know when you were cutting that, that this was going to be something that is to this day emulated and parodied and and all that? I mean, did it did it feel like a special scene when you were putting it together? Um, yeah, it did. I mean, it was exciting to you know such a you know from beginning to end. I think it's about eighteen minutes. The, the CIA. Yeah. And the silent section, I think, is like nine minutes. Yeah. Like just total, almost so, complete silence. So, of course, it's an homage to Jules Dassin, mm-hmm. right. who had done two pictures that were inspired, yeah, that inspired the sequence. Yeah. One was Reefy Fee, where there's a break in to a, uh, I think they're breaking through a wall into the neighboring building for a jewelry heist or something. Right. And there's 20 minutes of silence in that no dialogue no music and that was famous in the 50s Rififi and there was another picture called Top Cappy where uh, there's a theft in a museum and the thief is lowered by a rope because the floor is sensitized you know burglar proof so Jules Dassin saw the picture and said are they allowed to do that? can they do that? (laughs) so you know, Brian's never been shy about uh, using other directors as his as inspiration. Mm-hmm. And uh, when challenged about it, he likes to say, "Genius selects its influences." <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So that's that's a, uh, and I think you know, in fairness, uh, artists have borrowed from other artists forever. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just something that happens. It's an endless cycle. And, uh, I forget some composer said, you know, he, he was accused of of stealing a melody from somebody else. And he said, well, I, I, I did it much better than he did it, you know. <laughs> and you could argue that Brian did it much better than, had been, than it had been done before. Right. Do you remember working with an ILM artist named Stu Mashwitz? No. Because he was at ILM, we interviewed him recently, he was just talking about, just you were talking about the, the, going back to just the, the emotion of a scene and how a thing like the rat or something that Stu described was like the, the sweat dropping. And like his hand comes over and catches the sweat in a way that completely does not make any sense physically, that he would be stretched out like this and then bring his hand over, but you just accept it because emotionally it's right and you're just like, you know. Yeah. There, there was a, a screening recently, um of the first movie and there was an audience and the whole audience gasped like it was a uh, great Patrick told us about that he yes was, he was at that at screening the museum yeah, it was, it was in, in, in New York a couple months ago Tom yeah. was having trouble holding that that position you know because right. it's hard you know so he kept his foot kept touching the floor or whatever you know and uh Brian could say come on Cruz one more that's the you can do it you can do it come on <laughs> and he got him to do it you know well we, we heard, uh, we've heard that he put English pound coins in his shoes to balance himself out. Oh, maybe. Were you on set for no, that? No, no. I had never heard that story that about the authorized being spelled incorrectly. Yeah. Well, of course he wouldn't because yeah. we replaced it. Right. But it's so, I mean, today you would just digitally paint it out or whatever, but yeah. you actually had them reshoot it, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Well, it had to be. Was there anything that you cut that you wish was still in the movie? It doesn't seem like there were like a lot of deleted scenes or, or anything from that one. Mm, not really sure. When we were planning Mission Impossible 4, there was a lot of talk about bringing um, um, oh, Vanessa, Redgrave Vanessa back, back yeah. which would have been great. Yeah. And in fact, the guy who worked for her in the first movie was hired, right. and yes. they shot with him, but right. you know they, they couldn't 
make a deal. I don't know what the problem was. They yeah, make a that's deal what Bird said. That yeah. That's why they had that guy because they thought that the, they were going to shoot those other scenes later that with Vanessa. Yeah, yeah, which would have been happen. great. Yeah. yeah, when we talked to Brad Bird, he said that Paramount didn't pay what Vanessa Redgrave rightfully deserves, and so that's why. And that was surprise. I mean, what was your experience on Ghost Protocol? Because I I, I can't quite make it out in the book. I mean, it seems like. Um, like your interview process was sort of weird and it was a little weird. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that at all? Well, I went to meet Brad in, uh, at Paramount and, uh, it's funny. What I remember was that he and I were dressed almost identically. I forget what it was exactly, but top hats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, cl- clown masks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think it was t t-shirt and sweater or something. I don't know. I forget, but sort of, had this moment of, oh, we're dressed alike, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and then he talked a lot about it himself and what he, you know, and I thought, great, you know, it sounds great. And that was that. And then I met JJ and Berkey. Have you met Berkey? We've never, we no, haven't met no. anyone at, the, at Bad Robot. We've got to have him on. Oh, Berkey's a lot of fun. Uh, JJ's a lot of fun, but he's a busy man, you know. Listen, if you have any email addresses, all very busy. we're open. <laughs> We will receive anything. It was interesting that you talked about when Brian Burke, the producer, came in and sat with you and worked on the cut. And, and you know, you had reassured Brad Bird, like, we, we will not change anything without your blessing. Right. But were there, and you said that he had some good ideas. Do you yeah, remember did. what some of those things were, that adjustments that were made to Ghost Protocol? Well, we worked very hard on introducing the uh, Jeremy... Um, Jeremy Renner. Jeremy Renner's character. Yeah. Because he was just there in the car when, you know... There wasn't really a reveal or, or, you know, so we, we did the best we could. And, you know, he, he, um, what was it before, but compared to what it ended up being? Because you didn't go into detail about that in the book. I was curious. I don't remember specifically, you know, this is, what year was this? 2010 or something? Yeah, 2011. Probably, you were probably working in 2010 on it. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I had fun with Berkey because he would say something like, you know, can you trim that shot a little, you know? I said, well, it's only uh, 24 frames. He says, yeah, but it, uh, I'm bored. I'm bored. <laughs> so I said, took off two frames. And he said, oh, yeah, that's much better. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, he was funny. He was... Can you talk about constructing the opening? Because you get a little bit of a better picture of it in the book, but there was an opening plan that had the ice chase and right. all these things. Right. There was a, a battle on the ice with snowmobiles and... The stunt guys were all ready to go. They're up in Canada. They had this big uh, ice battle worked out with stunts that you've never before seen with snowmobiles, and they were really psyched. And then the studio just said, "No, you can't do that. It's too expensive." So at that point, I think we had already shot the scene that was supposed to intercut with the ice battle, which is Holloway in the train station. Yeah, and okay. and her on the train. Oh, okay. So there were three lines going. There was. It was uh, Paula on the train and uh, the station, you know, and this ice battle. So we tried to make it work as planned without the, the ice battle. It just didn't work. And um, we came up with the idea of playing half the scene as a flashback when after Cruz gets rescued and mm. he's there, he's getting uh, they're debriefing him or he's debriefing them uh, in the back of the van that they're in. And... We used the iPhone as a link, as a transition, and we, we used elements of the scene that was designed for the beginning at that point to explain what had happened. And we used other elements from the beginning scene to open the movie without explanation. So the idea was, I think, the, the best way to start a movie, which is show something, explain nothing, raise a lot of questions in the audience's mind, and then they're hooked. They're interested in finding out what what was that that we just saw, you know. So um, got this idea from Lee Child who wrote about the Jack Reacher books, which are real page turners. I usually read them in, you know, one or two sessions. And uh, he said, it's easy to write a page turner. You just raise questions in the reader's mind and then they'll turn the page to find out the answer. So um, this is exactly opposite what they do in fantasy films where they have long explanations, you know, to tee up the movie 
and nobody cares and nobody's interested and they can't process the information anyway. And, you know, it's just a complete uh, misunderstanding of the storytelling process. So um, I thought Ghost Protocol came up with a great beginning. Guy gets killed, his papers are stolen, we don't know what, what was that, you know. And we find out two scenes later uh, what's going on with a flashback that was originally intended to be at the beginning. And was this all your idea or? You, you know, know, when you're working on a movie, you can't, rem you know, uh, I, I think maybe it was my idea, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. You yeah. Know, you're working with somebody and, uh, you know, somebody, one of the questions, I've been doing a lot of interviews lately and one of the questions that keeps coming up is, do you consider the editor as the author of the film? And I say, no, I'm not the author of the film, you know. But when I thought about it, you know, I realized that the most successful films that I've worked on are usually, for the most part, a product of me working with the director, period. No producers, no studio, no, you know, just the two of us working like, George and I cut, the, you know, did the final version of, I wouldn't say I cut the movie, but you know, he and I worked on the final cut of Star Wars. Um, Brian and I did the final cut of Mission Impossible. Brad, there were Cruz and JJ got involved at the end, but mostly it was it was us, you know. But um, but all the all the early Brian films are just him and me, you know. Right. I'm curious what Jay. Do you remember anything? Any suggestions that JJ had for for Ghost Protocol? Like what his influence on the movie was? JJ only came in for a day or something. You know, I, I, he may have been more involved in in uh, shooting decisions and production decisions, but um, he wasn't in the editing room terribly much at all mm -hmm. did you ever edit a version of the end of the movie where tom was sort of removed from the imf because it sounds like that was the major area of contention towards the end of the movie was whether or not he was going to still be there was there ever an edit where he was no longer a part of the group or was was that sort of worked out behind the scenes i don't remember okay i think last time you told us it was above your pay grade yeah, because yeah. we asked you about the whole. There was a sort. We've had a couple people tell us. It sounds like about, <laughs> <laughs> about how Tom Cruise was maybe. There were a couple people at Paramount that maybe were trying to get him out of the series, but you said you had not witnessed any of that. Uh, I know we did a reshoot toward the end. We picked up a bunch of shots in a night shoot in Santa Monica. Yeah, right. I think that was some of the, the stuff that Lindelof wrote. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Yes. So you've been involved in two Lindelof reshoot endings. Yeah, I haven't watched Watchmen. I'm curious. Oh, it's so good. Is it good? It's amazing. Oh. Yeah. Is it too late? Have I missed anything? Oh, yeah, I can still get it, right? Yeah, it's on HBO oh. On Demand or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty wonderful. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, Paul was working on World, World War, Z, War Z, right? which yeah. you never thought was going to be a big <laughs> well, see, I, I'm kind of a snob, I admit it, you know, and I thought, I think... Zombie movies and vampire movies are like the stupidest genre in the world. You know? <laughs> so I saw this thing and I thought, oh, give me a break, you know. And, uh, and it was really a mess, you know. I, how, I forget how detailed I got in describing the, the cut, but when I saw it, I thought, oh, I do not want to get stuck on this thing. So I said to them, how would you feel if you had two editors working on this? They said, who else are you thinking of? And I said, Billy Weber. They said, yeah, we love Billy. So I called Billy. I said, you want to do this? He says, yeah, great. And I said to him, I'm going to look for another job. So <laughs> just be prepared to take over if I leave, you know. <laughs> so um, this is just an example of how uh, I'm not always right about things. Um, so we looked at the cut. The cut was like two hours and 20 minutes, something like that. And the third act was something like 50 minutes. So the first two acts were uh, an hour and a half. And then there was this 50 minute third act that looked like it came from a different movie. What was it? Uh, the story is pretty much the same up through them getting on a plane in Israel, at which point Damon took over and did a fabulous job rewriting the ending. But... Um, when I saw the picture, I said, you know, the third act doesn't work. And they all knew it. And in fact, the head of production at the time, uh, Adam, um, was it Adam? 
I can't remember these guys' names. I don't commit executives' names to memory. But, <laughs> um, he shocked me by saying, I knew it didn't work, but I had them shoot it anyway. I thought, what? You know, you don't do that. You, and and uh, Ian Bryce, who was the line producer, I guess, told me that he told them they should shut down and rewrite and then go shoot the new pages, you know. But they didn't do that. So they get on the plane, and originally the plane was going to Russia, not China. I forget if it was... It was yeah, that thing goes to... Huh? It doesn't go to Russia anymore. Right, so the yeah. plane lands in Russia, and Brad Pitt goes to work in a mine. <laughs> They're working in the mines, and there's a group that organizes against the government, and I don't know, there's this big uh, action sequence with crowds of uh, Russian prisoners, and uh, the zombies come, the Z's come, and, and the they discover that they, I don't know, it was just so... <laughs> so I mean, I'm sad that we were robbed of quality uh, Brad Pitt in a mine footage, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, and they're slaves. They're all slaves, you know. They're prisoners and made to work in, you know, on inhuman conditions down in the, in the mines. So, Billy and I, go, you know, so we take the first two acts, which had been an hour and a half, and we cut it down to 52 minutes. Wow. We took out all the stuff that was terrible and, and just kept what we thought we needed. And then Billy did a version of the third act that was eight minutes long. Had been 50. And his version was eight minutes. Holy shit. <laughs> so we were, we were then faced with a 60-minute 60, 60 movie. <laughs> That, that, cost, that cost, cost two hundred million dollars. <laughs> Only the good bits. So, yeah. So they said, no, no, no. You can't do that. You know, third act's got to have this, 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 and this. I said, all right, I'll do that version. So I did a version that had all those. That was twenty minutes. Okay. So we now had a seventy-two minute movie that cost two hundred million dollars. <laughs> At which point they decided to regroup and called Damon, and Damon came in and watched it and. He turned to me and he says, you didn't tell me it was such a mess. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, that, I thought you would fix it, you know? You're the guy to fix it. <laughs> and he did. I thought, you know, what they came up with was great. Yeah. The zombie on the plane, you know, it's like snakes on a plane. It was great. Right. Yeah, and it had a nice kind I of I love that title, snakes on a plane. I thought, I wonder what this movie's about. <laughs> <laughs> So would you would you describe your experience with Brad as a positive one? Brad? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, on Ghost Protocol. His, his, Ghost Protocol. Yes. Yes. Yeah. His his uh, methods were new to me. I wouldn't endorse them, frankly, but that's the way that was his process. Uh, there's a there's a rumor or a belief afoot among young. I wouldn't say young, but you know, inexperienced directors that I've heard this a couple of times now. They say, life is too short to watch a rough cut. This has sort of gotten around that, you know, they talk to each other and they say, oh no, the rough cut's a horrible experience. You don't want to, don't watch the, you know, just, you know, don't put yourself through that or whatever they're saying. It's, it's a terrible rookie mistake not to watch the film because the rough cut is not designed to be the cut of the movie. It's it's, you know, as I explained in the book, half of what we're doing is building. Um, so when the editor presents the rough cut or first cut, it's not, design, it's not a, a, a version of the movie that's meant to be the, the movie. It's uh, the result of weeks or months of work of the editor building the scenes and putting all the little goodies in there that could possibly be of value and putting them all in and you put it there and you stand it up on the table and you look at it and you see what you've got to work with. And you need to look at the whole film and then identify which are the most urgent problems and address those first. And you don't take, you don't start polishing the film in scene order. You do it in order of magnitude of the problems. You face the biggest problems first and you deal with the smaller problems later. Or sometimes what we call, you know, dealing with the crocodile nearest to the canoe. <laughs> so um, Brad didn't want to watch the whole movie. He, he, you know, he 
and I couldn't get him to watch the whole movie. And finally, we were going to be showing it to uh, JJ, and you know, I said, "Look, you don't have to watch the movie. I'm going to watch the movie because I feel like it's my job to watch the movie." You know, when you sell an experience to the audience, you're not selling scenes; you're selling a two-hour experience or two-hour, twelve-minute experience or two and a half-hour experience, and they're very different. You know. So you have to have that experience to judge if it works or not, because length is a function of interest. If you have a three-hour movie that's really interesting, like I saw the, the Children of Paradise, a French film, I got to the end, it's three hours, I got to the end and I thought, that's it? Because <laughs> I was so into it, you know? Whereas, you know, I saw Zelig, and after 20 minutes I thought, oh my God, I can't believe, you know... <laughs> You don't like Zelig? Uh, I love I, that movie. I like it for about 20 minutes. <laughs> it's a short movie, too. It's not short enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like 82 minutes or something. Like, too long. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that, you know, if you're interested in it, then it'll play. You know, right. I, you can't tell that until you watch the thing. And to, uh, I've worked on a couple of pictures now where, and you know, Brad was sort of guilty of this, not watching the whole movie. And I finally said, look, I'm going to watch the movie from beginning to end. So he says, all right, I'll watch it with you. So then... When I first worked with Herbert Ross, who was a very experienced director, had come up uh, from being a choreographer and had worked on many, many films. And Herbert used to say, you only get one opportunity to see your film for the first time. And it's a very important occasion. And when he presented his film to producers and studio executives, he'd always say, please don't take notes. Just have the experience. You'll have plenty of time to make notes later. So I think this is very good advice. First time you see the movie, just experience it like the audience experiences it. And um, I've lived by that. And I think it's a, it's a good approach and smart way to approach cutting pictures. Brad, and I said this to Brad, and Brad said, okay. And then he took notes through the whole screening and had his head down <laughs> in his notepad during half the film. He would look up and then he'd write something down. And while, meanwhile, the film is playing and he's, you know, not seeing that. So anyway, but I did get him to, to watch the movie through. And uh, so, you know, it, it was a bit of a struggle because uh, he was an animator, very successful animator. He's a very talented man, very smart, very funny. Uh, but he had his way of working that was not, you know, what I thought was the smartest way to go about it. It's, it gave oh. me such agitated reading that description. I'm sure it would have did you too, of him going back and wanting to stop the movie and look at certain right. scenes and it's like, oh my god, it just seems... Well, God love Paul Hirsch, you know? Yeah. What a, what a great guy. He is so great. I want him to adopt it's, us. I too. feel like I just we I learned so much from his from talking with him and reading his book. Highly recommend you get the book. Do you think that Grant should read this book? Grant, your editor? Yes, he's my roommate in college and one of my best friends, and he is an editor. He is, has edited for David Fincher recently, the last season of Mindhunter. Sure, yeah, he should read the book. You gonna get it for he, him? I don't think he needs to. Well, it sounds like... Maybe he does. You know what? Yeah. No, I'm going to say it. Even Grant needs to read yeah, this Yeah, I think you should get it for him. <laughs> Maybe I will buy it for him for I'd Christmas. Say, there's some tips in here you might want to think about next yeah. time out. I bet he's going to listen to this episode, too, because he's going to want to hear Paul Hirsch. He probably turned it off already now that the interview's over. Probably. But still. <laughs> but hey, that's um, fine. We've got more installments coming up. Yes. Um, but until then, if you want to do something, you can always sign up for our Patreon. Yes. Commentaries for all six movies. Mm -hmm. Bonus episodes. We're doing more bonus episodes these days. And um, yeah, and we always love input on what you'd like to see from our Patreon. If there's something that you'd... We're, we're taking... We've got some good suggestions from people. Commentaries for some other Tom Cruise movies. Mm -hmm. Someone wanted a collateral commentary, a diehard commentary. Uh, people have asked for a lot of things. We're going to do them all. We're going to do our... Uh, top 10 list of the year. We'll do a bonus episode for the Patreon for that. Yep. And then we'll do our best of the decade mm -hmm. episode as well. So sign up for the Patreon. It's at patreon.com slash light the fuse. And if you don't feel like you want to do that, then you can buy a shirt. Yeah. Or, or magnets. Pin. Yeah. Magnet, pin, whatever from our T Public page, which is linked from our website, which is lightthefusepodcast.com. 
We got some new logo tees. Yes. That look great. Yes. Your wife, Katie, made some wonderful, t- made all of our wonderful t-shirts. Yeah. And uh, you can see, makes for a good Christmas present. Yeah. Or birthday. Or birthday. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Yeah. Uh, Hanza. Easter. Whatever. Whenever whatever. You, whenever. I don't know what time of year you're listening to this episode, but I'm sure someone needs a good birthday present coming soon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get them a light the few shirt. Yes. Boxing day. <laughs> um, and as, as always, this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon. And is mixed and edited by Luke Burson. And if you could do us a favor and like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you are listening to this podcast. And just tell people. Just tell your friends. Tell your enemies. Even better. Ooh. (laughs) So it would help us out a lot. And um, yeah. We'll be back next week with Paul Hirsch. And thank you again to Kevin Blumenfeld for our music. Yeah. He did the, you know, the legally dissimilar main theme. And then the... Legally identical, <laughs> <laughs> the plot theme, <laughs> as yeah. that uses our intro into the interview. Yeah. So Kevin Blumenfeld's awesome, and Kevin did the music for my movie, which is out that now. is on Hulu now. Yeah. If you want to watch it, it's called A Nasty Piece of Work. I would say the, I would say the reviews are rolling in, but just one review. We don't know yet. Just a tweet. It's coming out in a few days. Yeah. There's been a tweet and one review. <laughs> What's the review say? The review said it was good. It gave it eight out of ten. What site is this? this is like. It's some Harry's small, hatchet some, some, heads, was, some, I'm yeah. not sure. Okay. <laughs> someone, I feel like a lot of the horror uh, sites review. Someone things. sent it to me. I think Kevin found it, our composer, and he okay. sent it to me. All right. Uh, but yeah, so early word, the small amount is, is good. <laughs> yeah. I don't, by the time this is out, this episode is out, you will know. And maybe the tide is completely turned and it is all bad reviews. And the consensus <laughs> is... But check it out. Anyway, yes. regardless. It's, decide, free. it's decide, free. Decide, decide yeah. for yourself. If you have Hulu, get it. Or uses someone's password. Yes. So it's part of the End of the Dark series. It's a feature called Nasty Piece of Work. And it's great. Yeah. And Kevin's music is wonderful. So thank you, Kevin. I have not heard that yet. So. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. You saw an early cut yeah. with, with temp music. Yeah. So that's good. I'm excited for you to hear what he came yeah. up with. Me I too. I think uh, he did some awesome stuff. Well, until we meet again and meet Paul Hirsch again, that's it yes. for us. Yeah. See you next week. All right. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. If you'd like to watch the original Mission Impossible television show, all seven seasons are currently available to stream on Amazon Prime. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.